Lakeland Public Television presents Currents with host Ray Gildow. Sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everyone. I'm Ray Gildow, and you're watching Lakeland Currents. Thanks for tuning us in tonight, where I have an opportunity to introduce the new president of Central Lakes College. Her name is Tara Charlier. Welcome to the area. Thank you so much. And I have a confession to make. I have never met a person named Hera. <laughs> You're the first. And I have a real serious question to ask you. Have you ever met anyone named Ray? I have. Oh, shoot. I've got you on that one. <laughs> well, welcome to Brainerd. Thank you. And how long have you been on your, in your new job? I started July 1. July 1. And mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from, what's your educational experience. I'm sure a lot of curious minds would like sure, to know. Sure, sure. I'm originally from upstate New York, small rural area, very, very agricultural, um, and had wonderful opportunities there. Loved growing up in a tiny little town. And I really struggled in college. It took me five different institutions to get my bachelor's degree. Even though I had my parents went to college and it should have been easy for me, I really struggled. So I finally graduated from Cornell and was going to be a vet. And then I didn't oh, get really? into vet school. So <laughs> did not have a plan B like many students and went and got my master's from Miami of Ohio. And when I finally got into vet school, I had started teaching and I just fell in love with teaching. So that So what was your master's in? It was in microbiology. Oh, microbiology. So my bachelor's is in animal science and uh, the master's is in micro. And certainly you realized that would train you to become a college president. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how that actually works. So then when you got out of the classroom, where did you go? Uh, I ended up teaching at Miami of Ohio for five years on their faculty. What, what's that enrollment like? Oh, about 16,000 when we were there. So okay. it's a pretty big school. They've grown since then. It's a big Midwestern school. Mm -hmm. So uh, for five years on the faculty, my husband, who's a watchmaker, was relocated. And I couldn't find a position in academia. You know how that works. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going into private industry selling scientific equipment, which was one of the hardest thing I've ever done. But it was also my foray into administration. I became director of operations. Yeah. So I did that for five years and loved the microbiology and the science. Did not love the mission, but did love helping people to reach their potential as a manager, a director. So when I finally got the opportunity to come back into academia, I happened to find myself in community colleges. And I realized that the students there reminded me of myself when I was struggling as an undergraduate student because I went to two community colleges and without them, I wouldn't be doing anything that I am today. Mm -hmm. So everything just kind of clicked and I realized that I needed to be in community colleges is really what I was called to do. I was on the faculty, then I became a dean, a vice president, and here I am. I think that's an interesting point you make that uh, the two-year colleges are so mm -hmm. vital to the development of so many people who sometimes made a mistake in life and oh, yeah. walked away from school and came back to a college. Tell us a little bit about Central Lakes College, what you offer. I know you have him worked there myself, but you have more than just the degree programs. What, what are some of the other things that you have at the college? Well, what's really um, wonderful about comprehensive community colleges like Central Lakes is that we really are comprehensive. So we have the community college programs that one thinks about, the liberal arts and transfer, so that students who are interested in starting at Central Lakes and going beyond and elsewhere are very well prepared to do that and we know that our students are very successful. But we also have an extremely strong emphasis in career and technical education programs that are so important to especially rural areas, but truthfully, all of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So videography and nursing and heavy equipment and the list goes on and on. And those programs are designed to have students enter immediately into the workforce. And I think those are very exciting programs because as soon as we moved here, I ran into our students who are then working in the field. So we do all of that range of programming in addition to customized training, working with business and industry to meet their needs and designing programs for them and making sure that students have great student life so they can be successful. I, I've, it's kind of interesting to me to see the evolution of mm. the colleges in Minnesota because when I first started in the college system, we just had technical colleges in right. Minnesota four-year colleges, two-year colleges, private schools, and then when we merged in 1995 to become this system that exists now, that's constantly changing too, but uh, basically the, what happened isn't what was explained was going to happen mm. from our legislature at the past, and not to bring up old right. things or not, but 
it's just very different than what we thought it would be or what it would look like. Because we thought an original uh, that local economy would still be important, that you would mm -hmm. still have local control. Well, that's all gone now with the state mm -hmm. system. And there's probably been good things about it. One of the driving forces about that was to make it so that wherever a student took a course, they could transfer to another school in the state. Is, is that getting easier? And, and I know you don't have the history here in Minnesota. Right. But from your knowledge, is it getting pretty easy now if you took a course at CLC, you could transfer it to Duluth, the unit UMD at Duluth? Yes, I think that it's always something that systems struggle with. The system I came from did as well, but there is a huge emphasis on making that simpler. And I can say that you know one of our children is a student at CLC, so she's looking at what where her courses transfer, and they will readily transfer to almost every institution across the state. So some are more streamlined than others, but Minnesota State is now working on making sure that that pathway is as smooth as it possibly can be. Now you're not called Minsky anymore. Oh, no, we're not. What, what is it called now? Okay, so we're still Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, but we're not using the acronym MINSKU because it's confusing to students and in itself doesn't mean anything. So we are Minnesota State. Minnesota State. That's right. But there is also a campus called Minnesota State. There is. So that's, that's a little confusing, isn't it? <laughs> <coughs> it is. Is that, is that the Wadena? I yes. can't remember. Detroit Lakes, Wadena. That, and Fergus that, Falls, and right? Fergus Falls. That's so that's correct. Minnesota State, too. That's so right. there's two Minnesota states, but that's not your problem. I think to solve. that's Minnesota State Community and Technical <clears throat> College, and okay. the entire system is Minnesota State. Okay, so the the colleges that you came from, you were a dean, weren't you at one time? Were you I a was. Dean? I was a dean and a VP. And were you dealing with unions when you had your college that you were at? No, before? that's such a good question. Um, Virginia is a right to work state, so no unions at all. You know, great relationships, faculty contracts but no unions, so a very different environment. The other thing I've noticed uh, in just in reading the papers that we now have about 50% of our college presidents are women. Hmm. And I don't know that there's another state that can make that claim. I don't know, but I would be surprised. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? It is, it's truly amazing. I think <clears> that, um, I think it says a lot that the system has emphasized equity and diversity, and it doesn't happen um, accidentally. You know, they train their, um, search committees to just realize that they have some implicit bias and to make sure that everyone has a fair chance, that we have good mentors, great professional development. It's really one part of the, one of the things in the system that interested me mm -hmm. because to say it's almost 50% is uh, very unique, it, as it, you yeah. say. Yeah, it it's exciting. We had Lane Larson, the new superintendent of schools, on a while back. And we were talking about the funding issues mm -hmm. and the durability of leaders in higher ed and in the high schools. The average superintendent in America today lasts about 3.7 years mm -hmm. on the job. Uh, I'm not sure what it is for college presidents, but it's, it's dwindling all the time. And I can remember reading in the Chronicle of Higher Education back in the early 90s that we were going to have this huge shortage of educational leaders, right. both K through 12 and higher ed. And it's here, it's really happening. And I think the disturbing trend that we're also seeing is we're starting to see a huge shortage of teachers. Right. And part of that is the salary. Part of it is, I think, the perception of politicians and people in certain countries and places where we don't respect the uh, teachers in our country the way they do. I had a couple of former superintendents on last year and they were talking about Hong Kong and some of the Chinese yeah. places, how teachers are so revered because they see the value that they have in making a future right. for their country. So you're taking on a job that's very challenging, high risk and probably high reward at a time when the funding per student has gone from the, I got the data here, from the 2000, or 1991, almost $13,000 per student to about $6,500 today. So we've dropped that funding for students in colleges in half and so tuition has to have had had to rise to offset that and we're getting more and more heat from people who don't want the tuition to rise but across education the cost for most education is about 80 percent is in people in That's teachers right. and staff where do you see this going yeah. i'm not that you are the guru of this but no. just as a president stepping into this kind of a role now 
What, what do you what do you think is happening? Sure. Well, you know, the data that you provided is national data. So right. um, the good news and the bad news is that this is not a Minnesota problem. This is a national right. issue. <clears throat> um, and there was a time when I first moved into community colleges, the state of in that case, it was Virginia, but it was fairly common, provided about 60% of the funding. And that was, you know, over a decade ago. That's really almost switched. And now it's much greater um, that we depend upon tuition. In Minnesota, it is quite interesting. So not only has state support declined, however, the state has now put money back into our funding so that we don't have to raise tuition as, as in as such an extreme way. Yeah, they really wanted to put a cap mm -hmm. on that. And I think that makes sense because we know that the more we raise tuition, the more we decrease access. And if we're gonna meet our mission, we can't continue to do that. So it creates kind of a unique problem though. So in addition to the, sh to the funding shift in Virginia, I mean, in, pardon me, in Minnesota, we've actually rolled back tuition by 1% to make things even more For accessible this, to this students yeah, in this coming year, right? So that creates an additional challenge. So one of the reasons that I really wanted to do this and become a college president is I believe so strongly in community colleges. We're all facing this challenge. I think we will look different in five or 10 years. We have to change the way we do things. And the system, all systems, but Minnesota is no different, is looking at how we can become more efficient, how we can find different ways to do things so that we preserve what we know is so important. I wanna be part of that. So I think we're, we are in for some challenging times. I don't think people really, we none of us have the absolute solutions and I think that's to be expected. We'll be talking to the legislature and you know trying to get additional support. We are making changes at the system level to be um, much more efficient and we are working with students to help them be more successful so that when they invest in their college um, time, then they are actually successful. And I think that will help us tremendously. But it's a tremendous challenge. There's no question. It really is. Uh, I, I do some work with high school seniors and a couple of stat statistics I share with them is that most of today's high school seniors will have between nine and 14 different job careers mm -hmm. in their lifetime. Amazing. And it's important that when they walk into a college anywhere, I, I always tell them, if you want to go to Central Lakes College, you go there and visit it before putting your money on the table. Or if you want to go to UMD or North Dakota right. State, you wouldn't buy a $50,000 car, car without sitting in it or looking at it. So get a flavor of what it is that they do. And I think that the thing that's amazing about the colleges, especially the two-year colleges, is you have those diploma, d different diploma options. Mm -hmm. A person doesn't have to be locked into two years or one right. year, sometimes it's a six-month diploma that allows them to go out in the workplace and get a job. So being nimble and quick is what two-year colleges have been known for right. and I think still is one of the real features of what they can do but it's interesting uh, the Chinese and the uh, Indians have sent so many of their straight-A students to America because we still have the best educational system but this year for the first time we're ranked number two yeah. did you see that I did and that's you know, that's a little disturbing. It makes We've, us rethink things. It really does. It does. To, <clears throat> yeah. If there's any theme in education, it's going to be change, that mm -hmm. we really have to think about what we're doing and why we're doing it and be ready for that change and mm -hmm. be nimble, as you say. That is much easier said than done. Mm -hmm. you know? um, online learning. Where, where are you at with as a college with sure. online learning? What percentage of your programs mm -hmm. are online? Um, almost all of our programs, certainly liberal arts, but almost all of our programs have some online component. About 23% of our students take something online. I think it's part of the cadre of offerings that all colleges have to provide because our students have very specific needs and they need that flexibility in many cases. So the college has grown its online learning over the past about five years or so. So about a quarter of the students are doing some online learning. And we know that it's important that we assess our programs, whether they're a face-to-face -face program or an online program. So we do lots of assessment, as you well know, to make sure the students are learning. Those courses are equal in terms of their learning outcomes and how the courses are designed. However, one of the things that we're hearing from students is that they love online learning, some, but some really want more face-to-face. -face. So we're looking right now as a college at what is the right balance of face-to-face -face and online learning? We know that we need both, 
but there is no recipe to figure that out. So we're reaching out to students, we'll be having conversations with faculty, we're looking at student success data to see what that correct mix is. And we're bringing in some really interesting technologies. One of them, for example, is called Live Online. I don't know if you've heard about that, but most online courses are asynchronous, right? So the student's accessing the online course through a learning management system at the time, a time different from when the faculty member is logged in. Live Online is a platform whereby students can be sitting in a class, another student or group of students can be streaming from home, and they can all be participating in one-on-one -on -one discussion in live synchronous time, or they can watch it later. So we're hoping that technology like this helps to bridge the gap, give people some face time, but also the flexibility of online learning, and that we'll have to bring into our mix of what's working. And the bottom line is student success. Mm -hmm. You know, we can offer everything we want, but the, we have to look to see where students are successful and how they're proceeding toward their goals. That's the bottom line and where we're gonna be spending a lot of time. So I, I really do get a sense that you have a great student focus. I do. Um, and that's so vital, I think, for people in administrative positions to make sure that everything they do benefits students, mm -hmm. and that's good to see. What, what's the staffing level you have at CLC now? You've got mm -hmm. the Staples campus, the Brainerd campus. Do you have any on-site stuff going on in, on other sites, or is that basically? Those are the two primary <clears> sites. <throat> We're about 300 right 300. now, just on, just if it hovers, just around and 300. And student enrollment is roughly? About 5,500 students annually. So, um, and enrollment is a bit down. You know, and, and it is everywhere, I think. It is everywhere, that's correct. Um, we're down today, and it fluctuates quite a bit by about 4% over last, compared to last fall. So in a perfect world, we, that would not be happening, obviously. Um, right. But it's, a, it's another one of those challenges that right. nationally we're facing. Because every time you have enrollment decreases, you get budget cuts. That's correct. Um, we don't get the student tuition and fees, which is important to us. And it's not about students being numbers, of course. I mean, I think some people don't understand why enrollment's so important to us. And they think, gosh, isn't it odd that you're looking at the college like a business? We're not. We know that every FYE, as you well know, is a student. Every student has a name. Every name has a story. And the more our enrollment declines, the, the less likely we are to be able to meet other students' needs and provide wonderful programming for them. So we want enrollment to stay up because we know it's good for the college, but ultimately it's good for students in the community so that we have those resources to do great things. What, what's happening in your area of customized training? Well, it's interesting, uh, across Minnesota State, there are a lot of changes in customized training. We recognize that, you mentioned autonomy earlier, and there's still quite a bit of autonomy in all the different colleges. They do things very differently. And customized training is designed to meet the needs of all business and industry, as you know, in the region. It turns out it's very difficult to do that without tremendously um, strong staffing levels, and it can be quite costly. So we find that we're having difficulty meeting the needs of all business and industry. So the state is looking at a model by which Central Lakes College can do its thing. You know, we do a lot of wonderful things in leadership training and EMS and fire and you know, OSHA, lots of very cool things where we're strong. But if a business needs something that we don't have expertise in, the system would like to provide us with a way to tap into expertise that might be across the system. Oh, so we do a better job as a system meeting the so needs. So you have some te technical specialty That's right. individuals that could go to the sites and yep. work with them? They're working on that model. And the, the goal is really to meet the talent needs of the state in a better way. And I think that those conversations are very interesting. Of course, they also make people very, un they make people uneasy because change is not easy. But we've got a terrific team with a very open mind about how we can meet the needs of our local workforce and we have fabulous relationships. So we're very fortunate in that way. Uh, I have the opportunity to interact with a lot of manufacturing people in the summertime mm -hmm. from other states. Right. And they all are basically saying the same thing from Florida, Ohio, Indiana, doesn't matter where. I've had experience, they just can't find skilled workers. They can't find skilled welders. They can't mm -hmm. find skilled plumbers. They can't find skilled electricians. It's, it's a real frustrating thing to them. And I know it's frustrating to the colleges because when we've had those programs in the past, they haven't filled enough right. so we could keep them going. So it's kind of a catch-22 there, right. isn't it? Where it you is. don't have enough students, because you have to have a number right. to make these programs uh, operate efficiently in a college 
And so I think consequently what's happened is a lot of these industries have had to pick up their own training. Mm -hmm. And I think they found out how expensive and time consuming that really is. It's, it's, that's just an ongoing challenge. It is, and, <clears throat> and it, you know what, to be a, com a, a community college that meets its goals and its needs of the community, we have to have very strong relationships. And I think in this area, we're very fortunate to have the support of our business and industry leaders. But whenever the pattern that you describe happens, I think it's important that we sit down before it happens and ask the question, exactly what is it that you need so that we can tailor our programs? Every one of our CTE or career and technical education programs, as you well know, have um, advisory committees. And they're so important to us because some people assume that they're just there as rubber stamps and they're formality, but indeed they're critically important. They're our connection to the workforce. So if there are jobs that are unfilled and we have programs that have capacity, there's a disconnect. You know, we need to sit down and say, what's missing? Is the content not the right content? Is the equipment not the right equipment? What is it? And generally when we have those conversations, business and industry steps up and says, indeed, this is the, where we're connecting the dots and this is where we're missing it. I think the onus is on us to have those very candid uh, conversations. Yeah, I really think that's, I think your point is well taken that the industry should never sell themselves short mm. of how important their views are oh. because without those views, you're training people for things Doesn't that make don't sense. exist. Right. Doesn't make any sense. Unfortunately, a big part of our world is becoming security. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the state system has standards now. I know when I, we just started getting into campus security when I was retiring. Right. Um, this is a costly endeavor. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. It does. Is this something that the state works with you on or are you pretty much left to your own at the local college level to, to work with security? I don't think there's any college, certainly no community college, that doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about security. We wish the world was not that way, but it is, and it's our job to make sure that students have all their basic needs met. They can't be successful without it, and if they're not safe, uh, they, they just can't be successful. So it's a concern of all of us. I think it's one of the benefits of being part of a system, to be honest. Of the 1,200 community colleges across the country, they're not all part of systems, as you know. And I was looking for a system because I believe in a system you can leverage your resources, and that's a good example. So at Minnesota State, we have some great contacts. They help us to ensure that we're doing everything that we need to be doing to ensure the security of Central Lakes College. So for example, just two weeks ago, it was two weeks ago, we had a wonderful individual from Minnesota State come and work on both of our campuses to do tabletop exercises with faculty, staff, administrators, and local law enforcement to talk through how would we respond and how can we be prepared? It's things like that that um, the system helps us tremendously with. I really believe that that expertise was invaluable to people to understand this is what we need to do to make sure that we're paying attention to safety and security. It's not um, something that we can ignore. As the new college president, I'm sure you spent a lot of your early months here just getting a feel for the lay of the land and the, and the communities. but. Have you established some personal goals, some things you'd like to see done while you're here? Oh, sure. You're right. Um, I've been here for three months, so my first goal is listening and learning. I believe strongly mm -hmm. that um, I have to earn the right to be part of this college family. I'm very, very fortunate to follow in the footsteps of Larry Lundblad, who did a fabulous job. and. Um, I need to learn a lot. So I am listening and learning for the last three months and it's been eye-opening. It's easy to listen and learn about things that are currently happening. It's a little harder to get the history and the culture. So I've been working on that piece. But we're gonna be focusing on several critical things. First is relationships. I've talked to you about how without those relationships, a community college can't do its work. So we're focusing on building internal relationships primarily and external relationships. The college, has done a great job with community partners. So we're looking to deepen those partnerships. And then we're putting a tremendous focus on student success. So the college has done a great job bringing students in and has worked hard to retain them. We are going to shine a tremendous light on what happens when a student comes to Central Lakes College and what's their whole experience with the institution. Where are they successful? Where do they have bumps? What can we do to change that outcome and make sure that more of our students are retained and more of our students complete? So our goal is to increase primarily the retention rates of these students and to make sure that all of our students 
are being retained and reaching their goals, including students of color, American Indian students, first generation college students, those that are low income. So we're gonna really look at those data and move those numbers. That is my primary goal. It's the right thing for students, it's the right thing for college, it's why we all do the work that we do. And you have some pretty successful athletic programs. There's been a pretty we good do. history for a small college. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just want to touch on a little oh, bit of yeah. what you do. It's really exciting to me because the college I came from did not have intercollegiate athletics. So we do have very strong football, basketball, baseball, uh, volleyball, and golf teams. Um, they are a huge part of student life at Central Lakes. You know, we know as well do you that students are more successful when they engage. Mm -hmm. They don't just come to take classes. We like to, th for the, to think that, that academically that's the most important thing, and it is. We want them to work hard, but we also want them to engage, and we know the students who engage and feel connected to their campuses are more successful moving forward. One way we do that is by having amazing athletics. Our, st our athletic teams work so hard. I'm not much of an athlete, which is not uh, too hard to tell, but I'm learning a lot, and it's amazing how hard they work. So um, they're doing extremely well. Right now we have um, football and volleyball going, and they are both doing extremely well in their divisions. So there's a lot of pride around being a CLC Raider, a lot of pride, and it allows our students to have something to connect to. Um, something to be proud of and our student athletes are some of our student leaders so you should come out and watch a game if you haven't done that recently. If an area business person or anyone watching this program wants to get in touch with you how should they do that? Oh that's a great question. Well um, anyway I would love to talk to people it's it's really my job to make sure I understand what people feel about the college both the good and the places that we can build opportunity so you certainly call the college that's, that's fine, and you can. there's only one person with the name of Hera, so they just say I need to talk to Hera, and that's no problem at all. <laughs> they can email me at hcharlier at clcmn.edu, and they're welcome to just call me on my cell phone, which is on all of my business cards. So I just want to be accessible. I meet people for coffee. We talk about you know their perspective and the community, and um, that's part of me growing and learning both personally and professionally. So I'd be happy to hear from anyone. Just wrapping it up, one of the ways that we're working with you is we have our camera people today are your students in your video program. So exciting. So you're having an impact all over. It's terrific. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to be on our program, and I wish you the very best of luck in your new career, and I hope you learn to love the snow. Oh, I will. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It was it's delightful. my pleasure. Thank you. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time. <laughs>